Hi. Okay, this is Tom. I'm going <clears> to <throat> say a few things about um, this topic that we covered in the last lecture, and then I'm going to jump into talking about tax smoothing models. And I'm going to use um, an isomorphism between tax smoothing models and consumption smoothing models of a certain type. But before I dive into that, I want to, I want to, um, I guess, <laughs> sit back and make some philosophical comments about what we studied with uh, essentially sustainable or credible plans when we talked about the uh, Chang model. Um, which was which was our running example. <clears throat> so um, so here's where we're going to go to. I'm going to where I oh, and today I'm going to be using um, Quanticon notebooks for various these lectures. So you can you can get your hands on these notebooks, and if you have uh, loaded up Anaconda and Python, you can um, can actually run them. And for for me, that's a, that's a good way to learn and experiment. Okay, so here, here we're, I'm gonna just jump down to the end. So we're gonna talk about, remember our fourth model of decision-making in which um, governments were choosing sequentially, or there, you could think of there being a, sequ a sequence of governments. Um, each government at time T cares about what happens today, it also cares about the future. Um, and just to remind you, our, our key thing that was being chosen was this, this mu, this vector. And this, this vector is a, is a, it's a, it's a sequence going from t equals zero to infinity. And the time t government chooses only the time t component of that sequence. Okay. So we described a, an equilibrium government policy um, by which I'm in terms of our equilibrium concept included a notion of credibility. So this mu that ended up being chosen was a was an equilibrium object. It satisfied a bunch of conditions. Okay. So um, okay. So here's where I want to go. So you, so just going to jump down here, and I added a couple of things here. Um, so one thing I added was well, this was already there. I might have added it. There's this recursive representation of a sustainable plan, and I added that, or that that appears here. That's a a transition section to um, kind of whet your appetite for the the difference between the way a brew did things in his thesis and in his thesis he's he's doing the counterpart of thinking about reasoning all in terms of a sequence um so if you read his paper it's it's all about a sequence of you know, government policy is a sequence or a, a policy of a player is it is it as a sequence um, and all of his reasoning is in terms of a sequence. Now, it turns, what, what Abru, Pierce, and Stichetti did is they transformed things. Um, and they simplified things by instead of reasoning in terms of sequences of the policy, they reasoned in terms of sets of possible values. And, <clears throat> and kind of as a, you know, what, what, you, what you could do it's kind of like a, a transition thing. You could actually represent what a brew did as recursively. Um, and that's what these functions are here, where, where the recursion is, the, where the state variable becomes, it becomes a value. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna go into that any here. Um, there's a more Quanticon lectures um, and, um, that's a substantial topic in its own part. So here's what I want to talk about at the end. I want to go here is, and 
I'm going to tell you about, I'll tell you about the, um, how I'm going to get into this. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, a 1990s book by Alan Blinder, which is really interesting. I, th I think it's called The Art and Science of uh, Central Banking. And um, it's an essay. Um, Alan Blinder is a professor at Princeton. He was, in the 90s, he was vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. And after he left the Federal Reserve, he, um, he wrote this book about his experience there as an academic. Um, and the book, <laughs> what runs through the book is um, what we were talking about last time. Um, um, issues about uh, time inconsistency. Um, and, and what Ken was talking about, about um, time inconsistency and credibility and sustainable plans. So Blinder cites Kidlin and Prescott. Um, and he talks about time inconsistency and he, um, but he says he doesn't like the academic literature. And he said, he, at, at the beginning of the book, he says, um, it's kind of useless for uh, thinking about anything I had to think about when I was at the Fed. And he, he sort of, uh, in a gentlemanly way, attacks the theory from top to bottom. Um, and he does this in an early chapter and he says, um, okay, so from now on, I'm gonna talk about real world central banking and I'm not gonna talk about the Kidlin Prescott or sustainable plans or credible plans. I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna talk about real world stuff. But then, if you read the book, he keeps coming back to it over and over again. And it's like, uh, it's like uh, the theory comes back and keeps hitting him in the head, the same issues. So um, I want to phrase this toward the end of the book. <clears throat> he, actually, he actually talks about something that raises this issue, which is central to the theory that we talked about. Um, we might have talked about it a little bit last time, but I want to say more about it. The question is, we have this credible plan, okay? And remember, a credible plan for us is a sequence in the spirit of a brew. And that sequence, so what is that sequence we can ask? Well, in the theory, the sequence actually plays multiple roles. By the way, just like theta T for Chang, the brilliance of Chang's paper, theta T played multiple roles, remember? The, uh, the rate of inflation, um, it was a forecast, it was a promised value, and it turned out to be an equilibrium actual value. So, um, so there's, there's the same variable, what seems to be the same variable, uh, same label, theta T played, it's like a, an actor in a play that gets dressed up and plays multiple parts. Um, and being careful about that, actually, if you want to be careful, you kind of probably have to take out your big K, little K machinery, which I hope was talked about in first year macro last year. Um, if not, we'll talk about it some other time. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quant econ lecture where you can learn about it. You have to, when something plays multiple roles, um, that's when that machinery becomes active. Okay, so what's a credible plan now? Well, it, think about this. It's a sequence of actions chosen by the government. But it's also a sequence of private agents forecasts of government actions. It's simultaneously the two things. And once we construct our theory and have a you could think of it as an equilibrium or a, a credible plan is a kind of equilibrium. It's a plan that satisfies a bunch of conditions and the conditions are partly involving government optimality and partly by private agents optimality because the private agents are trying to forecast what the government is going to do. So what it is, it's, it's, it's both a government policy and it's a collection of private agents forecasts of government policy. So it's a forecasting rule 
We need the econometricians, and it's a government policy. We need the macroeconomists, and they're equal. They're actually equal. Um, so now you ask, who owns this thing? Whose is it? So, and, and this is, by the way, I, I'm gonna come back and tell you how this comes over, this issue uh, comes over and hits Blinder in the head um, at the end of his book. So does the government choose policy action or does it simply confirm prior private sector's forecasts of those actions? What does it do in the theory? So you got to make up your own mind on this as blinder is a smart guy. And if you read the end of that book, maybe you do it in the summer. Um, he hasn't made up his mind. So don't feel bad if you can't make up your mind. So an argument in favor of the government chooses interpretation. It comes from noting that the theory of credible plan builds into theory that, well, each period the government's choosing the action that it wants. I mean, the government's doing what it wants here, given the environment. So you could say it's obviously the government to choose. Well, wait a minute. And our a counter argument, an argument in favor of simply confirm interpretation, is just gathering from the, the key inequality that, that defines a credible policy. The government has a choice. It comes in, with a, with a, you could think of it as a, it is a state variable, and effectively, that that says private agents are expecting you to do this this time. And if you confirm what they do, you're going to go out with a certain continuation value, or a, that's intermediate through a set of expectations that the private sector is going to believe. Or if you disappoint them, if you're opportunist, you're going to go in with a you're going to go out with a different continuation value and a different associated reputation. So in the equilibrium concept, you're always choosing to to confirm the private agent's forecast. So one thing that's beautiful about this is the power that's being exerted by rational expectations here. So let's come back to Blinder. You remember in the chapter, I think it's chapter two of his book, he says, I'm gonna tell you about Kittle and Prescott, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Barrow and, and uh, reputational macro, and I'm gonna tell you I don't like it. It didn't have anything to do with, with the way I think about credibility. So then you go back to the end of the book. Okay, so at the end of the book, he's got a chapter where here's the theme. He said, uh, I would come in, this is Blinder speaking, I would come into FOMC meetings. Oh, I have to tell you an institutional detail, which you already know about. A um, couple institutional details. In the US, the way the Fed operates, um, and, um, you know, a whole, whole, the course would be what Milton Friedman thought about the way the Fed operates. Um, but the way it operates, uh, Milton Friedman was critical of, for it because he thought it got itself in big trouble in certain instances for operating this. So what the Fed does is it, it, it sets an interest rate on a certain instrument um, involving the federal funds market. So it sets that, that interest rate. Um, no, and of course, the way it sets it, 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 it makes some transactions to, to support it. It stands ready to buy and sell at a certain rate. Okay, but that's the way it does. And it's been doing that, it's been doing that for 30 years, some form or other. Oh, so, so it's been doing that. Well, financial markets kind of care about what the Fed's going to do. So guess what? There's a futures market where people gamble on what they make forecasts of what the Federal fence marks can be. So you can go um, look this up in the paper and people back out market forecasts. Um, and um, you can make your own bets and make money or, or lose money in it. Okay, so 
it, it turns out people have studied this. Uh, federal funds forecast the market, the futures market is a very good forecast of what the Fed's going to actually do. It, it typically nails it. Okay, so Blinder comes in. A blinder in his, in his uh, book, at the end of the book, he said, look, I came into this meeting and, you know, we're the policymakers and we're supposed to be, you know, the ones who have more information about the economy than anybody. And, and we have public interests and, and so on. Um, and I would come into these meetings, he says, and time and again, people would say, well, the market's expecting us to do such and such and we can't disappoint the market. Um, so we got to confirm what the market thinks. We're going to get in trouble if we don't. And Blinder said, so Blinder says, he says, well, look, he thinks markets are great. And guess what? Blinder, Blinder was a leading candidate to be head of the Fed in the mid nineties under a, a democratic president, Clinton. Clinton, he was probably tops on his list. So Blinder, he doesn't want to say anything. At the time he writes his book, he doesn't want to say anything to think that he thinks markets are wacky. He, no, he says, no, markets are usually accurate. Um, he said, but nevertheless, they're not accurate 100% of the time. They're not this, always smart. So he said, we shouldn't, he said, he said I, I had made arguments that, well, just because the market suspects us to do something doesn't mean we automatically ought to confirm it. Even though he says, well, I think they're usually pretty smart. And I guess most of the time I think we should confirm it. So you can see this very smart person who says he hates his theory and has nothing to do with the way decisions are really made. He comes to the core of the theory and he's actually wrestling with it. Um, so I find that beautiful. Um, you know, you wouldn't read Blinder's book to learn about that theory. Um, and he has some ways about talking about the theory where he puts new things on the table um, that other smart guys have come along like Marco Pacetto and, and um, some of his co-authors have come through and tried to make sense of some of the, the things that um, Blinder ta talks about that involves sheep talk. Anyway, this is something to think about. Um, so especially depending on what, you're, what country uh, you're from, um, um, this circle of ideas is really important. And notice the following. Now think about the Argentine government where, well, guess what? It's got, it's got, it's, it's got a, a credible policy, which is um, a lot of people think isn't, you know, over the years hasn't been very good, but it's been credible in the sense that f people forecasted the government was going to do it. And it did it confirmed it. Um, so one thing that happens with this theory of credible plans is there's multiple equilibria. There's, there's zillions of equilibria. There's zillions of credible plans. Um, and remember, one credible plan is supported by a prospect of deviating from it and going to another credible plan, which in turn is supported by, okay, so it's like a Russian doll. These credible plans, there's lots of them. So the notion that a plan's credible isn't, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not, it's a restriction. It just, not just anything be a credible plan. So, so there are lots of things that aren't credible plans, but there's lots of credible plans. And now, then you, then you wonder, um, so, so then you wonder, well, what determines which one you're in. And I haven't talked about that. And people have opinions on that. Um, you, know, you know, one branch says, well, obviously the best one's gonna emerge. And the reason the best one emerges is if you don't follow it, you're gonna get something quite bad. But that's not what the theory says. And depending on what time you're living in or what country you're from, um, you might or might not find that act, argument attractive. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about this. Um, I think um, this
there's more quantity kind of lectures about this in Lars Lindquist in my book, Recursive Macro Theory. There's a, a number of chapters about credible plans. Um, okay, so here's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to uh, next topic, which is, uh, it's actually gonna be, there's a pair of quantity kind of lectures about consumption smoothing. And, and these are, these are, um, these are elementary. You could, you could teach these undergraduates. Um, and they're, they're a, uh, they're a precursor of, uh, I'm, I'm going to use them to, to lead up to, um, the celebrated Lucas Stokey model of, um, of optimal taxation. A Ramsey plan that does optimal taxation, but um, before I do that, I'm going to I'm going to do this more elementary model where I'm going to shut down. This is going to be a prelim, a prolegomenon you can figure out to the Lucas Stokey model. But I'm actually going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm going to show the principal thing that uh, Lucas and Stokey were interested in, and um, and uh, not that you should be interested in this, but the way I'm going to present this actually. Um, explain some of the history of this uh, this particular topic because I'm old enough. I'm quite old. I'm old enough to I've seen I saw this stuff being created. So I saw Barrow give his um, his first tax moving paper at at Chicago in the late seventies, and I um, I saw that uh, Lucas was there, and he um, couldn't figure out what was going on. Because he couldn't figure out that it was going on, he, he wrote a paper with Nancy Stokey a few years later, which was his take on it. Turned out his take on it um, was related to what Barrow had, but it was um, but it was uh, was quite different. Um, that has to do with my remark about the baby throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and. Uh, the baby is manipulation of prices. Manipulation of prices, but I'm gonna come back to that. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over this consumption smoothing model very quickly. Because um, this is actually a baby's version of things that I hope you saw last year. Um, so I'm gonna show you the linear quadratic, uh, show you two things, a linear quadratic permanent income model. Um, of, of Robert Hall. And then I'm going to show you a, um, a perturbation of it that's designed to be a complete markets model. And the key thing here is I'm going to take prices as exogenous and I'm going to make, up, up, make them up in a, in a certain way. I'm going to make them up in the way that Hall made them up or actually Milton Friedman. So Hall had an incomplete markets model very much of the type that I think you saw the fourth quarter, but it had exogenous prices. Um, because he wanted to compute things, actually compute things, he, he, used a, he used a linear quadratic setup. So Hall used uh, incomplete markets. I'm gonna add, do a complete markets version. And you see what I'm gonna do. And um, the complete markets version is gonna be a lot about like um, Lundquist, Sargent uh, chapter eight, but it's gonna be so stripped down we could teach it to undergraduates fast. Okay, okay, so here we go. So here's some history. Um, so I'm gonna show you two consumption smoothing models first, take about 10 minutes doing this. So here's the deal. Um, Hall assumed an exogenous process, uh, stochastic process of non-financial income. So there's gonna be some labor income or non-financial income that's just gonna be exogenous. It's going to be a single consumer. And then he's going to assume there's an exogenous gross interest rate on one period risk-free debt. So the only thing that this, uh, consume, this consumer is going to want a smooth consumption across time and states, but the only way he can do it, income is, income is non-storable. The only way he can smooth is to buy or sell a one period risk-free bond. 
just like in Buley models. This is a precursor to a Buley model, if you will. But we're going to freeze that interest rate at beta inverse. The gross interest rate's beta inverse. So beta is a discount factor of the consumer. So, you know, key thing in those Iagari or Buley models you saw was beta times R. In those models, it was going to be, those models in the equilibrium, they're always less than one. Well, here, because we want to recover Hall and Milton Friedman, beta times R is going to be one because the gross interest rate's beta inverse. This is the deal. So I'm going to maintain Hall's assumption uh, when I go to a incomplete markets version of, the, in the, of, his, uh, of, the, of, the, of his model. In addition, I'm going to, um, I want to stay as close as Hall, but I want to put complete markets. So complete markets is I'm going to add a complete array of, I'm going to stick as close as possible to Hall, but I'm going to make one change. I'm going to let there be arrow securities, one period arrow securities, and there's going to be a complete array of them. That's going to be the deal. And I, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to do that. And then here's what this quantity con lecture does uh, for fun. Um, there's going to be um, two possible, everything now is going to stem from, well, what's the stochastic process for, um, for non-financial income? That's what's going to drive things. Um, okay, so we're going to have two assumptions. We're going to assume the stochastic process for non-financial income uh, or labor income, some people call it, or labor earnings is just exogenous. It's either going to be generated by an end state Markov chain. And lots of times I'll just set n equal to two. But when we get to now it's going to carry us a long way. Or it could be described by a linear state space model with a continuous state vector that's going to live in some big state space. And it's going to be driven by a Gaussian vector IID shock. So both of these things are Markov. One's finite state, one's continuous state. Um, okay. So that's where we're going to go. Um, Okay, this standard boilerplate. Um, okay. So what's going to happen? Um, outcomes in this model are going to are going to come from from a couple things. It's what the consumer wants. I mean, it couldn't be anything else. Outcomes are going to be partly what the consumer wants, and second what opportunities are available to them. So it's, as always, it's an interaction between desires and constraints. So in the complete markets version, um, I already told you, in the incomplete markets model, there's only one asset. It's a risk-free one period bond. In the complete markets models, you have all these arrow securities. Okay, and in the two state, Markov chain, there's only two securities every period. In the end state Markov chain, there's, there's, um, there's n, n versions. In the continuous state Markov chain, there's a continuum of one period arrow securities. Um, okay. Okay, so here we go. So, oops. I don't know what happened there. Oh, I know. I clicked, I clicked a, I clicked a link. This is Quantis, Econ is so great. I clicked the link and there Ken Arrow came up. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I'm in this Quant Econ notebook. So here's going to be the linear state space version of the complete markets model. Um, so what we're going to do. Um, so here's the deal. In the incomplete markets model, the, the consumer could, so I'll, I'll do this linear state space version um, to, to map into, uh, I think some of the machinery that Ken showed earlier when we were doing um, basically linear quadratic Gaussian models. Um, so let's suppose 
that non-financial income is governed by the state space system. So why is non-financial income? There's some state X, it's a vector, um, it's a continuous state vector, and X evolves according to this first order linear stochastic difference equation, a vector stochastic difference equation. Uh, w is normal, zero I. Um, XT is, is this. Um, this is what the first year students in macro were struggling with this, this semester. Okay. Okay. So now what I want, I want to let there be some arrow securities and I want to, I want to rig things so that the risk-free gross interest rates beta inverse. <laughs> okay. There's only one way to do that. If you think about it. So in Lundquist type notation, I'm going to let QT plus one, I have no idea why Q, I, okay, why do people use Q as the arrow security price rather than P? It goes back to Pat Keogh or Bob Lucas. But anyway, that's a one period arrow security. If the Markov states X today, and you wanna buy a little bit of consumption next period, contingent on state being XT plus one, you gotta pay this. And so here's what this is. Beta times phi, what phi is going to be is phi is the multivariate normal distribution um, over xt plus one that's kicked out by, this is a conditional, phi is just the conditional distribution of xt plus one kicked out by this distribution. So it's going to be beta times that probability, that conditional probability. So I'm going to let q be my pricing kernel. And I'm going to assume it's exogenous and it's given by this. Why? Well, if you work this out, this is going to be sort of the complete market's counterpart of Hall's assumption that the interest rate risk, the risk, this was going to imply that the risk free interest rate, gross interest rate is beta inverse just by doing a little integration. Um, okay. So, So, so just to, so we're going to get some, we're going to get some nice formulas. So, so this is the trick. I'm going to, um, I'm going to write a version of Hall's paper, but I'm going to do complete markets. Why? Because I want to. And also Lucas and Stokey had complete markets. Remember Hall didn't I'll come back to that. Okay. So if you work this out, um, if you, Look this. Look. Look at this. If you buy, you want to know what's the cost. What's the cost of buying a vector b of x t plus one securities next period? I'm just going to have that. That's what I'm going to buy. The cost is going to be beta times phi. Well, that's that's q. That just turns out to be beta e t b t plus one. Beautiful. So what's going to happen in my complete market setting? Here's going to be my budget constraint every period. Um, this is a baby's version of Lundquist, Sargent, Chapter 8. Consumption plus, um, plus the debt that I owe, BT, I owe BT today, is equal to my non-financial income plus, um, well, um, if I want to pay this and I, I don't have enough, what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue one period error securities and I'm going to promise to pay BT plus one tomorrow. That's a random variable. It depends on all the states. The value of that today is beta ET BT plus one. And that's, this is all a consequence of my assumption about, uh, um, no, well, this thing's a risk-free rate. Um, Okay, no, 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 only if, it, only if A is the whole set, only if A is the whole set. Okay, it's a consequence of, of this being my pricing kernel, and I'm assuming that's exogenous. Okay, that's it. Um, so, so that's the deal. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show you the, uh, there's the consumer's budget constraint. Okay, and I can go, 
you know, I'm going too fast for this to be self-contained. Um, but I'm counting on you kind of looking at this and, and then going looking at Lucas and uh, looking at Lundquist, uh, looking at this uh, lecture. So if I, if, I take, if I take the government budget constraint and I integrate it forward, I get this. I get B is equal to this thing. Um, and, um, and, and by the way, if I want to be technical here, the difference between the complete markets and the incomplete markets model is all going to be about measurability of BT with respect to what information set. With complete markets, BT is, is measurable with respect to information at time T. With incomplete markets, it's going to be measurable with respect to information only at time T minus one. Store that comment. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that the, the consumer cares about this, the discounted value of uh, utility. What I'm gonna assume for utility, I'm gonna assume quadratic preferences because I want linear quadratic. So um, gamma is some bliss consumption level. Um, this is gonna give me, this is gonna give rise to linear uh, marginal utilities of consumption. Um, now it turns out with complete markets, I don't have to stay with linear quadratic. I could just have you. I could just have this a nice concave utility function. You're going to see why in a minute. With incomplete markets, I'm going to to work things out by hand. I'm going to be linear quadratic. Okay. So here's what I do. I'm going to take the first order conditions for this problem, and they're going to look like this. Notice there's no e. You work this out. Do some work. And what you'll get is what you want to do is completely smooth consumption. The first order conditions for this problem say that you completely smooth consumption. You set consumption equal to a constant. How can you figure out what that constant is? Uh, you just manipulate the time zero budget constraint. Um, you assume that you come in with some time zero debt. So now, the deal here is. Um, in this structure with complete markets and this assumption about the pricing kernel, we're going to get complete consumption smoothing over time and across dates. So there's just going to be a constant. So, so that's it. Okay. So essentially, um, you know, so we did some examples here. Um, which I'll let you look at. Uh, income rattle, rattles around or not, consumption doesn't move at all. And what's going on? It's the, it's the private sector, the, the, the consumer's buying insurance. He's, he's insuring himself, he's buying and selling state contingent claims next period in order to completely smooth his consumption, just like chapter eight. Okay, so, um, so in that graph above, non-financial income fluctuates in a stationary way. Consumption is completely con constant. Consumers' debt fluctuates in a stationary way. In fact, because non-financial income is a first-order AR process in that example, the consumer's debt turns out to be an exact affine function of the consumer's non-financial income. So remember this. That consumer's debt is going to turn out to be an exact function of XT. So the incomplete markets model version of this is um, um, is is given in another lecture. Um, that that's the celebrated version of the Hall model, in which uh, income uh, consumption is a random walk. You can't completely smooth, and the best you can do is make consumption a random walk. And um, there's these two Quandicon lectures. Let's say if I uh, if I uh, I hesitate to do this, I'm going to push this button. Let's see what happens. I'm at a slow connection. What'll happen sooner or later is. Um, I'll be taken to uh, another lecture. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is talk about a finite state Markov process. Um, I'm just gonna repeat things. 
um, kind of boilerplate. I'm going to, uh, and when I come to text smoothing, I'm actually going to use this a lot. I'm going to have now there be a finite state Markov chain, and I'm going to use that to drive financial income. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about a couple, a couple, uh, a couple models. Um, so this now is going to look a lot like Chapter Eight of Lindquist Sargent. There's going to be complete markets. Um, I'm going to have these one period arrow securities. I'm going to uh, have these. Uh, I can organize the prices in the into a matrix QIJ. Um, and um, okay, here's my here's my. Uh, Budget constraint for my consumer, consumption plus the debt I have to pay off is my income as a function of my Markov state. Um, and then next period, if the Markov state is J, I'm gonna buy BT plus one. Um, and here's my here's how much I have to spend to buy these uh, state contingent security. Uh, how much, I'm actually selling debt. So this is debt. This is how much I get from selling these securities. Um, okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this up because I want to stick close to Hall. I'm going to say these arrow security places are beta times PIJ. Why? I don't have a theory of it. I'm just making it up because I want the counterpart of the, uh, the risk-free rate to be equal to beta inverse. Okay, so, um, so this lecture describes this. Um, okay, so what's going to happen now? Um, what the consumer is going to want to do is um, now, now we can we can actually compute a bunch of stuff. We can guess that um, um, and this this is going to carry over. What the what the consumer is going to do is he's going to completely smooth consumption, and then what he's going to do is in every Markov state. He's gonna um, he's gonna buy beta J. There's gonna be no history dependence here. There's gonna be no history dependence. I'm sorry, BJ. BJ is gonna be. There's gonna be some quantity BJ that the guy is gonna want to um, buy or sell in Markov state J, and um, we can get a, a system of uh, linear equations that we can solve for these. That's what this lecture does. Okay. Um, so what the later part of this lecture does, it, it goes through and, and computes, um, it computes consumption. Um, so what, so what, what the consumer does is he makes consumption perfectly constant across time in Markov states. He purchases state contingent debt that depends only on next period state, doesn't depend on today. Yes, just so why is that true? Um, and then the final thing is, look at this. If the initial market state is SJ, initial debt is B0, then B0 just sits there in state J. Um, if I were you, I couldn't follow this in real time, but if you do the calculations, you could do it. Okay, so here's some code. Okay, so there's code. Um, you know, there's code that does the, the the complete markets version and the incomplete markets version, and um, all this code has a very nice simple structure. Okay, so so here's here's what happens. So what we lead up to is graphs that look like this. Um, the green line, this is a two-state Markov setup. The green line is income. The, um, the orange line here is consumption in the, in, in the complete market setting, as smooth as a pancake. The incomplete markets model consumption takes a random walk, just like Hall told us. Um, and the debt pass um, turns out debt, debt turns out to be co-integrated with consumption. So in the complete markets model, Debt just has two values, one when in state one, another in state two. So it oscillates between these values. I'm sorry, there's debt. 
Um, this is debt with complete markets. And you'll see it's a copy of income. Debt's a copy of income. Okay, this is gonna be important. Um, when we talk, when we move to the, um, when we move to the uh, tax moving interpretation, because um, this is the part uh, of Barrow's paper that Lucas Stokey couldn't understand, because Barrow said some things about taxes and government debt. Um, which couldn't be true in a complete market setting. Okay, so now that's a, that's we're done talking about the consumption smoothing model um, in, with complete and incomplete markets. So now you could ask, I said I was going to talk about tax smoothing, and why am I spending all my time talking about? Um, consumption smoothing. So it's a good question. So um, let's take a little break and then I'll, uh, I'll try to, I'll try to explain myself.